Welcome to Show Me the Money with Michael Dirk. Show Me the Money is a podcast that is bringing in industry leaders in the commercial real estate sector that are either on the financing side, the development side, the acquisition side, disposition, brokers, investors, bankers, management companies, everyone that's in and out of the the business and all um, facets of the trade so that hopefully you can benefit if you're looking to grow your business, start your business, or maybe transition into something else. On this episode of Show Me the Money with Michael Dirk, we have Mr. Stephen Gordon, who is one of the titans in the finance industry, one of the biggest bankers that you know I know in California. Very honored to have him here as a guest, and I think you'll benefit greatly from listening to him and the expertise of what's really happening in the banking world today as far as deposits go and challenges that lenders are having, especially as interest rates are in flux and the Federal Reserve is changing things very aggressively in a very short time frame. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third episode of Show Me the Money. I'd like to introduce our first guest right here is Mr. Stephen Gordon. Stephen Gordon, thank you for being here today, first and foremost. It's a pleasure. Stephen is the founding chairman and chief executive officer of Genesis Bank. He has nearly 40 years of financial industry experience, including serving as founding chairman, chief executive officer, and president of Opus Bank founding chairman and CEO of Commercial Capital Bank and its holding company, Commercial Capital Bank Corp. Incorporated, as well as chairman and CEO of Fremont Investment and Loan, which I actually formerly worked for, (laughs) and uh, its holding company, Fremont General Corporation. Additionally, Mr. Gordon served as partner at Sandler O'Neill and Partners LP, a New York-based investment banking firm, now Piper Sandler, and joined the firm at its founding in 1988. Genesis Bank is a California state firm, a chartered commercial bank organized by Stephen. The bank focuses on serving the financial needs of small to mid-sized businesses and owners and investors in income producing multifamily and commercial real estate located primarily in the diverse majority minority markets of Los Angeles and Orange Counties, California, as well as Western portions of the Inland Empire, Riverside and San Bernardino counties. Genesis Bank is designated by the FDIC as a Minority Depository Institution, MDI, and is only the second diverse multiracial MDI in the U.S. The bank's products, services, and solutions primarily include traditional commercial business, small business administration, known as SBA, income property, and owner-occupied commercial real estate, loan and deposit products, as well as treasury management services and solutions. Genesis Bank is headquartered in Orange County, California. So, uh, starting right in here, Stephen, what has the last year looked like for you and Genesis Bank as far as deal volume and and the transition of the interest rate market? How are you? You know, how have you seen things over the past year? Okay. So, um, so Mike, first, thanks for having me. All right, second, listening to my bio, all that really means is I'm old, and I've been doing this for a long time. It's impressive. <laughs> it's not really all that impressive. But um, the, the last year has really been a whirlwind. Um, we launched the bank August 2nd after Opus was acquired in 2020, and I really felt there was a need for a bank that you know, could have true impact in the communities that we serve and, and have that both be uh, economic impact as well as, well as social impact. Sure. And, and felt like, like, in listening to the bio, you know, when I said all it means is I'm old, I'm, it's at now 60 years old, I really felt that while there were a lot of other ways of measuring the impact that previous banks that I built had had in the communities, that that here, you know, that this bank from almost, I've been asked if this is like a legacy kind of thing, but but this bank must be the most impactful bank that I've ever built. Okay. So this last year has been the whirlwind of launching the institution really a year and a half ago in um, August of 21. And and then um, 
forging partnerships with the Hispanic Chamber, the Black Chamber, the Asian Business Association, um, being extraordinarily responsive to the clients that we previously had, let's say back at Opus or back at Commercial right. Capital Bank, and that following that we've built, as well as making sure that um, we're doing all that boring stuff like making loans and bringing in deposits and growing the balance sheet of the bank, and and making sure that that we're really uh, understanding internally the the role and purpose and mission of the organization of the bank and making sure that everybody buys off on that mission and that we're really on offense while we're surrounded by banks now that are playing defense. Yes. And, and that happened very quickly in the midst of everything while the Fed has been very constructive dealing with inflation and, and whatever those actions may now bring. Right. And, um, and I think the, you know, we launched the bank knowing that at some point there'd be an economic cycle that would hit and that backs, banks have a tendency to back away right. and clean up their own mess whenever we hit this economic cycle. And, um, and it's hit, it's happening. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, yeah, but it's been it's been a you know a real slog battling in the in the trenches, trenches every right. day, yeah, you know, and um, and building the company. Right. Well, it's hard enough in the best of times starting a company and growing it. <laughs> right. right. As maybe you started the company four or five years ago, it probably would have been a little easier. Obviously, you come out of the gates right now, and you're just like boom, with obviously everything transitioning, tightening of the balance sheet, uh, interest rates doubling, the market slowing down, all those variables. You know, obviously your experience goes without saying you're the right person for this, to put this together. And I think you're really going to be seeing the examples magnified exponentially from a lot of your competitors out there of decisions they've made over the last three to four years. I mean, I could, you, you know them as well as I do. I don't even need to say names, but a lot of these lenders we've worked with on the multifamily and commercial sector over the last couple of years can't even sell their paper now yeah. because the rates are too low. Yeah. So they're having deposit issues, big, big deposit issues because deposits are going to non-money center banks at much higher returns. So they're really at a, a standstill in some cases, and it's becoming an issue to do deals with them on this side, and it's affecting you know the ability to transact in the market. So I don't know if you want to maybe speak to that and how we kind of... Well, you've made like five or six really important points somewhere, you know, in, inside of all that, which is, yeah. you know, the last five years, last, and, and you've heard me say before, we're 12 years into a 10-year cycle. Right. And, and during the last 10 years, all you had to do was own something. You didn't have to be all that right. bright. You Throw didn't a have dart. to be, you, you just, you know, it, everything was going in one direction. Right. And it was very clear it was going in one direction. And now you really find out how good you are. Yeah, now now you got to be you know you got to be really skilled you got to be really talented you have to have seen cycles before you have to know how to navigate a cycle an adverse cycle um, and and you have to understand that things don't only go in one direction right and and you're bringing up a very interesting point about you know deposits finding their way into somewhere else right. they're they're not even moving into money center banks they're moving, in a sense, almost out of the banking system. And, and all of a sudden, banks are competing against the Fed, and banks are competing against the U.S. Treasury, and they're competing against the capital markets. Right. And when I say that, it's that you know, short-term treasuries are now 4.5%. And no bank wants to pay four and a half percent for deposits, right. and depositors are suddenly paying attention to the interest that they earn on their money. And for years, for a decade, nobody even cared right. because they were earning almost zero on their money right. anyway. Right. So they didn't look at what the interest was that they didn't earn. And, and now that money, you know, everybody is scrambling, really fighting for liquidity, fighting for deposits and making sure that at least here at Genesis, you know, we do everything we can to differentiate ourselves. So it's not sure. just about rate. Yes. Like you got to bring brain power. You got to lead with brain power. You got to lead with ideas. You got to lead with solutions. You have to lead with, with something besides just, I can offer a better rate on the loan right. or a better rate on the deposit. Yeah. Cause I think anybody certainty can of execution. do that. I mean, it's, it's huge. Certainty of execution is yes. important in a market where the other point you brought up was all of a sudden there are fewer lenders. Right. And we've seen that happen before. Right. Right. In past cycles, you know, it's gone from those who were dominant multifamily commercial real estate lenders, all of a sudden laying people off, shutting down divisions, moving liquidity and capital, allocating it elsewhere in their organizations. Right. And this is even without the credit 
part of the cycle hitting yet. Right, right now, the only component of the cycle that's hit is structural liquidity related components of the cycle. Yes. But if you look at all the bank's earnings that are coming out you know, this quarter, we're still not seeing a credit problem. Right. It's not as though non-performing assets are increasing on balance sheets, right. but reserves are increasing in anticipation of something that may happen at some point. Right. So it's, it's, you know, everyone's looking for when the real crisis is going to show. Sure. But right now, you know, the, the crisis is that of how are you going to fund that next loan that you want to make? Right. You know, what are you going to fund it with? Because if you plan on funding it with deposits, they're going to cost you maybe three times what they would have cost you before. And if you're not going to fund it with deposits, wholesale funding, capital market type of funding is extraordinarily expensive. That's all costing north of four. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, you know, the regulator's greatest concern right now isn't loan portfolios that are going to blow up. It's liquidity in the banking system. Because liquidity is leaving. But that's exactly what the Fed has been trying to do, to slow down yeah. the economy, get banks to stop lending. And the way to do that is dry up liquidity. Right. So, yeah, the result is here of what they've, what they've set out to do. So the question is, you know, where... Where does it go from here? I mean, you've made. Well, it only some... gets better. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty, you know, it's pretty daunting and scary, but there obviously is a light at the end of the tunnel and there is going to be great opportunities. And I have so many clients that are, you know, say, hey, Michael, where, where are these notes? You have all these lender relationships and all, they've got to be so underwater. And the basis is across the United States today, there really isn't those opportunities. I think I've gotten two phone calls in the last 12 months on two notes. Out of, out of 500 different lenders well, because, we work with. Because banks don't have to mark the loan portfolio to market. Right? That all just sits there in, in what's kind of like help to maturity. Right. And, and those loans were made at par. They stay on the books at par. And that may be a loan that they made at 3% that's fixed for the next seven years. Right. And, and maybe, you know, maybe the borrower is paying interest only. Sure. It's not amortizing, yeah. and the loan just sits there. But their next incremental cost of funding is north of 3%. So they're underwater, absolutely. Right. But they're not forced into selling. Yes. They're not going to be forced into selling until liquidity really becomes a problem beyond where it is today or where non-performing assets begin to become a real issue. You had mentioned that you were also at Fremont General. Yeah. I was brought into Fremont General to clean the place up. Right. You know, Fremont Investment alone. I was, that's Fremont where I started as an analyst. Yeah. Right, right, that college. place was an absolute disaster. And it, it started out with liquidity and then it turned into non-performing assets. And then it turned into, they originated a ton of subprime loans. Oh yeah. Well, they were one of the largest subprime. 120 billion you know. of subprime loans right. that they originated. And the regulators and made them that's make right. those loans. <laughs> and when all that stuff begins to crack, right. that's when things start coming out for sale. Right. And, and we're not quite at that point yet. And, and are we going to get to that point is really driven by, by what the next Fed moves are. Right. And if the Fed does what the Fed is expected to do, which is, you know, in the next handful of days, 25 basis points, right. rather than the back to back to back to back 75s, you know, that maybe if they really do truly do 25 right. and pause and kind of wait to see the impact of all of this because it is having an impact. Right. Then, then maybe a soft landing is possible. Sure. Right. Maybe softer. Or maybe the damage has already been done. Right. It's so it's, it's, it's pretty significant. I mean, obviously, on deals we're underwriting right now, the cap rates versus interest rates, it's completely out of whack. Right. Like you were talking about, you know, we have the inversion on the yield curve right now with short-term money, five and seven-year T bills north of the ten-year treasuries. Yep. You know, SOFR is, is is very, very high right now. So you look at these spreads and, I mean, it's difficult. The rate caps on some of these larger deals on a bridge facility and whatnot through agency execution, you know, it's several million dollars potentially up to that basis to to get some of these rate caps and some of these deals we're working on right now. So the economics on deals are, are very challenging, to put it very politically correct. Well, add on to that, that, you know, somebody wants to uh, pay off a loan, they're having to come to the table with you know, with more equity than they thought they were going to have right. to, right? They're coming to the table with money that they, that only six months ago, they weren't having to. Right. And, and that's because of how fast this all moved. Yes. And it's also because of how we banks are having to underwrite loans. Right. Right. And, um, and then the idea of, you know, but still people are paying relatively full prices for assets when they're buying stuff. 
Right. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. Yes. Right. Well, there's still exchange money in the market today as that we speak needs that needs a place. Side. Soon as that, we've seen the volume significantly across the country go down. Soon as that exchange money leaves the market, dries up. Now we have fresh equity coming in to buy property. Now that's where the rubber hits the road, and that's where we're going to see real pricing. Well, change. ironically, when you talk about the exchange money, you think of that as the exchange money that's happening outside of the banking system. That's you know somebody buying an asset and wanting to or selling an asset and wanting to defer their taxes, yes, yes. their tax basis into what they're buying. All right, but that's happening. It's touching the banking system mm -hmm. because a lot of banks out there actually end up escrowing or or handling that 1031 exchange transaction Being on the balance sheet. Which you do, right? Which I did back in Opus. I had acquired uh, Commerce Escrow oh, yes, and that's RPM right. Investments, right. and they were the largest independent 1031 exchange accommodator in Southern California. Right. Well, now Pacific Premier, who bought Opus in their most er recent earnings release a couple of days ago, they, they actually stated that those balances have significantly declined oh, yeah. that they were holding. And, yeah, you know, one point I think I had about seven hundred million of it, and those balances I'm sure are a fraction of what they were. Mm -hmm. Whereas we organically started that over at Genesis, and we're growing it. Right. You know, we're taking market share away from others who are who are really struggling. Yes. But that you can generally measure, you know, how the business is doing by looking at how those real estate deposits are doing. Right. And they're down significantly Sign across yes. the country. One hundred percent. So volume activity, and then. Yeah, we've got uh, a tax lawyer who's on our board, a well-known tax lawyer, and his business is now real estate tax lawyer. And he's doing about 20% of the business he was doing six, nine months ago. Right. You know, so we're seeing you know, a real shift occurring. Significant. I mean, it's going to be affecting everyone across the board. There's no one going to be left unscathed. And um, you know, I guess we had earlier on the show, you know, in talking about this, it's it's you know it's affecting the tenants in the real estate. It's affecting the owners of real estate. It's affecting the banks. It's affecting the owners of banks. I mean, it's affecting everyone who's relatively. I mean, you look at the the ripple effect in real estate and banking. You know, you drop that pebble in the middle of the pond, and that whole pond ripples, right? So, that's the effects we're seeing here. I mean, just the cost of living has gone really through the roof in the last couple of years, but. Yeah, but in a way, you know, the, the contra side of that is, this is great opportunity. Yes. Right? All, you know, we've gone from, you know, that, that environment where there were 20 bidders on a property mm -hmm. and, and every bank was clamoring to make the loan right. to all of a sudden, maybe there's an opportunity. I don't mean to use the word redundantly, but, but an opportunity for us to be opportunistic yes. and go on offense when everybody else is on defense. Right. And I think that's, I think there's been a lot of money on the sidelines mm -hmm. waiting for this moment. Yes. You know, waiting for the moment to be able to, you know, when things start to crack and break, right. maybe there's an opportunity to buy something a little cheaper. Maybe yep. there's an opportunity to aggregate. Maybe there's needs for a different kind of financing, like acquisition lines. Right. So that when, when the opportunity comes up, you can seize that moment and take something down and then put permanent financing on it afterward. Right. You know, there, there's, you know, so at the bank, I'm looking at it that way. This is- Which is great. You know, this, I'm, all of a sudden, I've got banks around us who are- you know, they're laying people off, shutting down divisions, and dislocation is occurring, and that means we can go on offense. Mm -hmm. Which is excellent. And that's that's very rare in the banking industry because most banks are clamoring today going into the defense mode like you're talking about, saying, well, you know, if it's a 40% LTV, we'll take a look at it. Maybe right. it's a 6% rate. I'm like, well, wait a second, this, this doesn't make any sense. That deal we just did with you three or four months ago was exponentially different. Right. Treasuries haven't moved that much. And all of a sudden they're saying, well, my deposits are moving out. So That's what's driving it. Yes. The deposits moving out of these big money center banks are well, really a challenge. And also banks that were just a few months ago doing things very transactionally, they really wanted to make the loan. Yes. And if they got the deposits, fine. Now they're leading with, how much am I going to get in deposits? Right. All of a sudden that's becoming... You know, the the first thing out of their mouths. Oh yeah. But from your standpoint, I'm sure you've got clients who have, you know, who who have also been waiting for this moment, who have been on the sidelines saying, "I can't buy anything in the right. last six months." Yeah. You know, and now they're you know they're 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 anxiously waiting for. Oh yeah. Like, what are they going to do? And their strategies being built around this. Right. And and I think a number of us are working on raising pools of money and making sure that we have things lined up for six months from now, a year right. from now, yes. however this is going to play out. Oh, yeah, 100%. And, 
you know, in reality, I think we will see this as a huge opportunity. And a client who was on the show, you know, earlier, uh, one of my largest clients, you know, he's got the ability with a checkbook in order to write checks for these deals. So when someone has to meet the market and sell, even if financing isn't there at a competitive rate today, whether it be Genesis or another bank or whatnot, he has the ability to stroke a check and do that. So people with real cash on the sidelines today can come in and pounce yep. on these deals. Rates may fall in the next couple of years. No one has any idea what's going to happen, but that could happen. Rates come back down. Boom, you bought it right now in somewhat of a distressed time yep. when money isn't there, readily available in a you know quick liquid format. Now, compare that to the what's been going on for the last 12 years. Yeah. The, alter, the, the contra to that is the syndicator. Right. Right. And, and I'm getting phone calls that I never got before from people who – you know, who were buying lots of assets, but they always came to the table with 20% of the equity. Sure. And then they always raised the rest of the equity yes. you know, to do their deals. Now, all of a sudden, the guy who they used to go to who put up a million, you know, that guy is maybe good for 250 And the right. guy who put up 500 you know, maybe they're 100 and everybody else, they're out. Right. right? So, so all of a sudden, we're getting asked for equity. And we don't really do that. But I'm getting really tempted to go raise a lot of equity in a yes. fund to be able to be there for that. Oh yeah. But but you're right. Cash is king, and the guy who's got the equity, right? You know that that's really going to be the guy who's going to control you know the opportunities in this next wave that we have in front of us. Oh, a hundred percent. Equity is becoming a big challenge to raise on deals. Even if people do have it, people are concerned because you know they're seeing the stock market, they're seeing the bond market. Yep. I mean. I don't know about you, but but for me, I think the only thing I made money on last year was in the energy sector, which I just got lucky. But in all my financing background and, and you know degrees I have, everyone's like stay diversified. So it's only a small sector. The rest of it, you know, you get your head kicked in. So real estate's been great, but now that's struggling. So it's like where is the flight to safety and you know the opportunity? But raising equity while people are getting out and people push the envelope and syndicators using other people's money yep. obviously take significantly more risk when then it's your own checkbook. Right. And so on that basis, I think raising an equity fund and doing that, which I'm sure is happening across the board right now with some other people, not you know everybody, but in order to put that together to become and capitalize on these opportunities that will be here in the next 12 to 24 months will be very lucrative. Yeah, you got to do it or else you're not going to be participating in what the next 12 months brings. Right, exactly. And it's usually the most successful people I've seen in the business are the people that are, as the house is on fire and the smoke is billowing, those are the people running in, you know, versus, you know, when it's all rosy and cheery, those are the people who have, you know, run to the table over the last five, six years and have looked like a hero, but some of them will need to leave. Right. And running into the building, you know, that's burning is... Right, and this could be different this time. You know, 08, 09 lasted for like a blink. Right. And there was so much private equity that came into the system. And things that were 50 cents on the dollar all of a sudden were 75 cents, right. you know, a moment later. And then all of a sudden it was par. Yes. Right? And then people were bidding up premiums. You know, so, and that, so that window shut really, really fast. Right. You know, this, this is... But it was very... It was very housing focused. Right. You know, it was the very subprime housing centric. This is, this is, as you said before, it's rippling across the economy. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, so how that plays into real estate, I think is a little different this time than last time. But I think that, you know, that the banking system isn't going to be um, addressed through private equity right. like it was last time. Correct. I think the regulators have learned too much from the last time around yeah. that they don't want private equity coming in and owning banks. Right. You know, that that doesn't really play very well. So it's, um, yeah, I think that, that you know, maybe you and I work on that, putting together that private equity fund, oh, no, you know, that equity in. vehicle, and we figure out right. how to address all this. Because yes. it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting. If people are already calling now this early, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we haven't even hit the storm yet. Right. Right. And then, and then, will the Fed be able to navigate it? You know, we'll see. I think we'll know over the course of the next, you know, month or so. Right. I mean, I look at you made a great point. That subprime was a blink, relatively speaking, to the whole market just crashing, all government driven. Right. Obviously, the, right. the rating agencies and everyone that put the A rating on, you know, zero rated bonds, which is still mind boggling. But, but everybody to me. was culpable in that. 
Yeah, yeah everybody oh, you're totally right. Whether it was the broker, you're, you're, whether it was the plumber who owned five homes, yes. you know, everybody played a role in the whole thing. Uh, you're you're so totally right. You know, but it was like a lightning bolt overnight, boom. Done. They came in, tarp, bailed every, you yep. know, did the bailout. And it's like, what? What just happened? Now it's almost like watching like a slow train crash it where you you have to watch it. They put your head in the seat and you have to watch this train crashing. You know it's crashing, but there's nothing you can really do about it. But again, the opportunities that will be there, just like you spoke about, I think should give people, you know, you know, keep their guts in check, I guess. Yeah, and, and historically, and this is the part that's really um, been frustrating to me over decades here. You know, I'm originally a New Yorker, but I've lived here since 95. Okay. And, and what I've noticed is that every time there's a real estate cycle here in Southern California, which is, you know, we, we care a lot about here in Southern California, um, since Southern California economy seems to be so real estate centric, mm -hmm. Every time there's a cycle that hits, it actually takes down small business with it. Yes. And, and that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're already seeing impact, you know, to small business. And we're already seeing layoffs out there in the economy. And we're already seeing, you know, like all different sizes of businesses in all different sectors. Right. Having to address their expense base, overhead base in order to fortify themselves heading into whatever this recession will bear. But, you know, that was part of the the impetus to, you know, to launching Genesis when we launched it. Right. You know, it always seems like small businesses are left behind, family-owned businesses are left further behind, right. and minority-owned businesses are left, you know, like way in the shadows. Sure. And, um, you know, we got to find a way, all of us, you know, really, you know, we, we've we been all fortunate. Now we got to give back and be committed to making a difference in our, in our communities here yes. in Southern California. Oh, yeah. And I love the family-owned business. I love the stories. So many of my clients over the years are family-owned instead of the big, you know, corporate structures, which, you know, nothing against the big corporations, great for them. But in the same respect, I mean, that's really what the country was built on. And to keep that basis there and everyone that's come over here, worked hard, done the right things, and not being able to survive is really hard to watch. And a lot of your clients probably didn't start out purely just real estate. Correct. They probably start out... You know, by by building a business, yes. built that business as a first, second, maybe third generation business, maybe sold the business, and then they got right. involved in real estate. Exactly. Right? And, well, yes, yeah. You know, so it's you know, this the whole business part of this is critically important. It is. It's it all ties together, and that's what I was saying. That everyone's going to be affected here. So I mean, um, where do you see you know Genesis now for the for this year and like next year? I mean, are you going to be, you know, staying in the market thick and thin here? Is that, is that the goal here? Or is there a potential where you may have to or want to just step back if things do transition more or you, know, you have more of a positive outlook from that st sector? So, so I like where rates are. It's, it was tough to make money when we were all making loans at 3%. Right. That was really tough. And, but every, everybody was doing billions and tens of billions you know, and destroying their balance sheets, not realizing they were in, at the bank level. Uh, you know, making loans now at 5 6% you know, and, and funding on average at 1% to 2%. And being able to leverage 11 times sure. in the banking system, that math works. Um, being a new bank with a new balance sheet, a clean balance sheet, without legacy loans, legacy systems, legacy technology, without having, you know, legacy branches at Opus, I had 50 branches and 800 people. You know, I don't know what I would do with 50 branches today because no one walks into a branch right. during COVID or post COVID. Right. So not having any of that puts me in a position of really being able to be, as I said, opportunistically on offense. Right. And as the recession, as this plays out, however it plays out, we want to be active. We want to be very committed to being there. Uh, while banks are backing away, that creates opportunity for us to, yes. to opportunistically take market share. Mm -hmm. And um, and the intention is to grow the institution. Yes. And it may even be that we get the opportunity to buy a bank, another bank, another few banks in this this mess as it plays through. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic, and um, and and I see where the opportunities are. Right. And there was some of our brethren, you know, some of our our brethren who who we're all aware of in the banking system, you know, those those maybe larger community banks, they're all struggling. 
Mm-hmm. And and I'm not so sure they really want to go through a whole nother cycle again. Right. Like it doesn't seem like it was all that long ago that 0809 occurred and <sighs> banks battled their way through that and that right. here we go again. Right. You know, it just has a different flavor, but it's not fun. No. Well, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you correct me, but I don't think the Fed would allow that. I think what they would do is do a maybe a potential another tarp for other banks that you know, are struggling or, or have those issues. So and actually would help them put a bigger stay on them to alleviate those private equities coming in. Right. I think that could be a long term play from the federal aspect. It could. It all depends on, you know, which administration we're under. This one seems to just be giving money away right. you know, for everything. And um yeah, you know, and, and seems to think that the solution for everything is just throw money at it. Right. right, and don't go to the core root of the problem. I think the banking system is the healthiest it's been. It's a lot healthier than it was going into 08, 09. Capital is much higher. Um, um, credit quality is much better. And and I think that the system is in a stronger position to weather the storm. Sure. But, but loan portfolios are upside down. Liquidity is challenging. And securities, investment portfolios are all a disaster at banks across the country. Right. So, um, so I think there there will be opportunity. The cracks are already showing. Yes. And and I haven't met a banker who's really all that happy. You know, I'm beginning to think no. I may be the only happy one, which scares the hell out of me. <laughs> and um, you know, so I'm a paranoid New Yorker, right? You know, right. If, I am too. If, if I'm smiling, me. something's wrong. Right. Right. So exactly. It's, but but I think that's going to create opportunity, and the Fed will. You know the, the 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 you know the government regulators will be there to you know possibly backstop the system. Sure. And uh, hopefully hopefully it won't be too deep of a wreck. Right. Because you, know? you can't have you know the crisis of confidence in the system. I don't know that everybody's ready for that again. Right. You know it's just a it's a good question and that's you know time will tell, but opportunities will be there. You know but. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting time right now. Maybe one thing kind of addressing just you personally, maybe if you can address something, a highlight in your career that was, you know, the high of the high and maybe something in your career that you look back and say, well, maybe I wish I would have done a little differently so that, you know, the the viewers here of the podcast, I'd love them to hear it firsthand from someone so successful as yourself, you know, People talk about the good things on the resume, but sometimes, you know, it's nice to... No, I've got them both. Okay. You know, for a while I didn't, but it's good to... Right. You know, now I look at it and and, and um, you learn from both. Um, the highs, you know, both Commercial Capital Bank, Commercial Capital Bank Corp. Um, I took that public through an IPO in, I think it was 02, and... And we went out with a $125 million market cap in that IPO. And four years later, in 06, the bank was acquired for roughly a billion dollars in an all-cash transaction. So, mm. so that, was, that was a pretty good high. Yeah, then, I'll say. Um, then Opus was also acquired. We started that, I launched that in uh, September 30 of 10, just an idea on a piece of paper. And that was acquired, announced to be acquired January of 2020 for roughly a billion dollars again in an all stock transaction. And uh, that closed in June of 10. So if you were to measure based on, you know, economic outcome, Mm -hmm. those were two pretty, you know, pretty solid stories. Um, But Opus was also, there's also another side to that story, which was the biggest mistake I made in my career was also made on the very first day of launching Opus, which was, you know, I launched Opus by leading an investor group of myself and some private equity firms that are world class, you know, private equity firms. Okay. And um, and we raised roughly almost a half a billion of capital between all of us to launch the bank. That was a pretty exciting story and got a lot of coverage and sure. yeah, that was pretty cool. Except for that, at the same time as launching it, I also agreed that. You know, just when someone raised their hand and said, I'll put up a hundred million, but I need a board seat. They got a board seat. Got it. So I had private equity in the boardroom. All right. And maybe I was young and naive and thought I could manage anything. And, um, it's three, also hard to say when someone's putting up a hundred million dollars, say no, it was hard to say no, but, right. but I'll get to that in a sec. But, but you know, I, three out of nine members of the boardroom were private equity. 
Okay. And I thought, all right, three out of nine, I can manage that. It's a minority third, aspect. Yeah. But it could have been one out of nine. Okay. And it was an absolute misery. Okay. And it really kind of set the tone of the company going forward. And and you know, so I committed after the sale of the company and before I launched Genesis, that if I was ever gonna do this again, I would never, ever have private equity in the boardroom ever again. Okay. And that was my number one. Uh, like my number one condition. Okay. That was also the number two and the number three condition. No private equity ever in the boardroom. Got it. And I've stuck to that because they want to. They want to be the controlling factor. Well, that and 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 short term outcome versus long term build and you know, and and everything is purely economic driven. And Got I'm it. a capitalist, so I believe in economic return also very right. much so. But. But sometimes decisions are not all near-term decisions. Right. And sometimes a private equity fund's agenda may not be consistent sure. with the company's agenda. Yes. And yet you may get to the same outcome. Right. But now you got conflict in the boardroom, and that sets the tone from the top of the entire company. Right. So, um, you know, so now... You know, Genesis is is the complete antithesis of that. We're still, you know, economic, socioeconomic, both driven and return driven. But but there's one agenda. Yeah. And and there's no conflict in the boardroom as to what the agenda is, and it's all understood. That's great. And and I view it this way. You know, there's 4,900 banks in the country. If someone doesn't believe in our purpose, our mission, and the impact we're having, and how we're going about doing it, invest in one of the other 4,900 banks. Yeah. Right. And and you know, so it's. Um, but that was my biggest mistake, I think, that I made in my career. Okay. And um, and I'm committed to never, ever, ever doing that again. Well. Wow. Obviously, you've, it's you've been very successful, and uh, my hats off to you for sure. It's been a pleasure working with you and your team too. Thank you. They are true professionals all the way through. All the banks that you've been, you know, the founder and CEO of, we've done business with them, and so it's been an absolute pleasure, and um, it's been an honor to have you here on the show. Well, thank you. So, the team feels the same way about you. The team feels the same way about your whole company, and um, and it's been absolutely my pleasure to be on the show. And I enjoyed very much having you on a panel that that I moderated, and and um, and now you're moderating me, and yes. I'm really enjoying this. So I'd love to <laughs> do it you. again anytime. Oh, you Oh yeah, for sure. We'll definitely have you back on here for sure. I'm sure thank you. there's a lot more to be happening in the market here, so it'll happen before you know it. And so um, I think that's going to be a wrap for um, for Show Me the Money. So I want to thank everyone for viewing the the show. Stephen Gordon, Genesis Bank founder, CEO. Um, definitely do some business with them because it's been um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.